I invite you to take God's Word and turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 24. Last week we looked at the Great Commission in the Gospel of Matthew, and this morning I want to look at the Great Commission in the Gospel of Luke. And I pray and trust that this will be a trumpet blast in each of our ears that will call each one of us to be engaged in the work of fulfilling the Great Commission in and through our lives. I want to begin by reading verse 44. We'll look through verse 49. This is the Great Commission in the Gospel of Luke. Now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in His name to all the nations. Beginning from Jerusalem, you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you. But you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. This is the great commission of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as it was given to His disciples immediately before His ascension back to the right hand of God the Father. And it was to serve as a compass for their life and ministry, always pointing them in the right direction. Uh, their lives could not be moving toward that which God has appointed for them, except they be moving in concert with this great commission. It was the big picture for their life and for their ministry. Uh, their lives could not be in the will of God except they be rightly connected with this which is the marching orders of Christ for His disciples, the fulfillment of the great commission. And so it is for each and every one of us here today. This is the big picture of our lives. This is the big picture for every father and for every mother here today. It's the big picture for every young person and every college student and every single. This is the big picture for every older adult as long as you are on this earth. This is the purpose for which you and I are here, it is to fulfill the Great Commission. And it matters not what other parts of our lives may be in right order, if we are disconnected from the big picture, we are like a ship that has gone astray from the dock because the rope has been removed. This is the cornerstone. This is the boulder. This is the anchor point for all of our lives. And we must move in concert with this great commission. Every one of us has a part to play in the great commission. Some of us here today are appointed to be preachers and to publicly proclaim the gospel. Others are teachers of the Word and work within the flock and the body and help equip the body to fulfill the Great Commission. But all of us have a part in going into the world, beginning with the Jerusalem in which we live, and to share the message of repentance and forgiveness of sin with all of those who are around us. And we all have a part to play also in praying that this work will be effectual and that God will use it with a glorious harvest of souls. We are all to be involved in encouraging and supporting others in the body of Christ that they would fulfill this great commission in their lives. All parents are to raise their children and to nurture them 
as arrows in the hand of a mighty warrior that one day they might be sent and propelled out into the world and to hit the target and to fulfill this great commission. We all have a part to play in the fulfillment of this command from our Lord. So it is very incumbent upon us today to make certain that we understand what are the particulars of this great commission because this is the purpose statement for each one of our lives. It is the purpose statement for this church. It is the purpose statement for every ministry and for every church. And so it is vitally important for us that we understand what Christ is requiring of our lives. And so there are five main headings that I want us to see as we look at verses 44 to 49 as we put our arms today around the Great Commission. I want you to note first, beginning in verse 44, the prophecy of the Scriptures. The Great Commission begins with the Old Testament Scripture, with the promise of the coming of the Messiah the Lord Jesus Christ. And in order for us to understand the Great Commission, we must reach back to Old Testament Scripture and put our arms around the entire revelation that was given under the Old Covenant. And beginning in verse 44, we read, Now He said to them, Now Jesus said, to his disciples. It would be important for us to note that this is the eleventh time that Jesus has appeared to his disciples after his resurrection. And I told you last time that he never appeared to unbelievers. He always appeared and only appeared to his own disciples because it would be their responsibility to go to unbelievers. It would be their responsibility to go to the world. And so the Lord would not, will not usurp this. He appears only to them in order to challenge them and call them to go to the ends of the earth with the gospel. This is a different appearance than Matthew 28 that we looked at last time. In fact, this is the eleventh and last appearance that Christ will make before He ascends back to the Father in heaven. This lines up with Acts chapter 1, verses 3 and 8. This takes place precisely 40 days after the resurrection of Christ and 10 days before Pentecost. And so we read, Now He said to them, These are My words, which I spoke to you while I was still with you. And this looks back on the entirety of the three years of His teaching ministry that he had with them both publicly as well as privately as he unfolded before them the full counsel of God. And concerning these words that he spoke to them, we read that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. With this, what Jesus is saying is that He has shown them Himself in the entirety of the Old Testament. And it is this teaching that our Lord gave of Himself in the Old Testament that would become the very bedrock foundation of the Great Commission. And let me tell you why this is important. Because when we go out to witness and to tell others about the Lord Jesus Christ, this is not a new religion that has just come onto the scene about 2,000 years ago. No, this message that we bring, it goes all the way back to the dawn of civilization. It goes all the way back to the very beginning of time. It includes everything that, is, that was said in Old Testament times and recorded in the, in the Old Testament and specifically all that was said concerning Christ. You'll note the threefold division of the Old Testament. 
as Jesus speaks of the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And by saying that, that is a way of saying the entire Old Testament. That's like saying from the East Coast to the West Coast. It implies in everything in between. The law of Moses speaks of the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The prophets were divided into two sections the former prophets and the latter prophets. And the former prophets included the historical section from Joshua to Esther. It included Joshua, Ruth, Judges, Samuel, Kings, Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. And the later prophets were divided by the major prophets and the minor prophets. It included all 17 of the prophetic books of the Old Testament. And the Psalms is representative of the wisdom books, and it is a, a, a literary device in which one book represents the whole. And the Psalms here represents Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon. And what Jesus is saying here, as we go out to witness and to tell others about Christ, we must have a strategic understanding of the entire Old Testament. And not just how to, to bring something up in conversation and then turn the conversation towards Christ. That's helpful. But we must be standing upon the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms and to be able to show that the entire Bible from the very outset in Genesis was all speaking of a coming Messiah who would come to this world and who would be the Savior of the world. The Messiah, it was said in the Old Testament, would be, would be born of a woman, of the nation Israel. He would be the son of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. He would be of the tribe of Judah and the line of David. He would be born of a virgin in Bethlehem. He would begin his public ministry in Galilee and there perform many miracles. And ultimately, he would go to a cross and there he would suffer in the place of his people and be their sin bearer upon the cross. And the entire Levitical sacrificial system was one large foreshadowing of the coming of Jesus Christ. Every Old Testament sacrifice that was brought to the altar and offered to God was a prefiguring of the sacrifice of Christ upon the altar of Calvary's cross. Every priest was but a picture of the priestly ministry of Christ Himself. And every high priest was but a foreshadowing of Christ who would be our priest, high priest. The Day of Atonement was the picture of Good Friday when Christ would make the perfect atonement for us. Every truth recorded in the Old Testament as it related to the Lord Jesus Christ was pointing to the coming of the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. The entire Old Testament can be summarized in these words. The Messiah is coming. He is Jesus Christ. And He will be the perfect sacrifice for sinners to take away their sin. Our Lord belabored this here in Luke 24, 44, and it underscores that we must be equipped with the full counsel of God's Word if we are to be effective as we go out and witness for Him. In verse 45, Then He opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. This was a supernatural work of grace as Jesus illumined them and caused the light of understanding to shine into their slow-to-understand hearts. The Holy Spirit shined divine light into their minds. And it was necessary for them to grasp 
the whole of the Old Testament and to see Christ in every place. Suddenly they saw in a moment that Christ Himself is the fulfillment of the entire Old Testament and all of the prophecies and all of the types of Christ. The God, or excuse me, the Christ-centeredness of the Old Testament. They saw at last the big picture of Old Testament revelation. Such that as they would go out and witness, it would not be a few isolated uh, things that Jesus had said during His earthly ministry, but that there would be a multiplicity of divine revelation that was entrusted to them and that they stood upon the very solid rock of the Old Testament Scriptures. In verse 46, Jesus elaborates on this yet a little more. And I would remind us the reason He does so is so that they will be properly equipped to be effective witnesses to fulfill the Great Commission. And so in verse 46, He said to them, Thus it is written. Let me stop there just for a moment. Please note how Jesus is continually taking them back to the Scripture. He is equipping them in the Scripture so that they will go out and testify of the truths that are recorded in the Scripture. He makes mention of the Scripture in verse 44, in verse 45, and in verse 46. There is the centrality and primacy of the written Word of God in the life of the believer who is effective as a witness for Jesus Christ. We are to be full of the knowledge of the truth of Scripture. Why? It increases our confidence that our message is true. And it also enables us to interact with people who need the Lord and to be able to approach them at the various different angles that connect with them. And it also enables us to answer their questions and it helps us keep on the big picture and the big path in our witnessing for Christ. So verse 46, thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day. The primacy of Scripture and within Scripture, the primacy of the Lord Jesus Christ. The person and work of Christ was the very uh, intersecting point in their gospel witness. What Christ would suffer refers to His sin-bearing death upon the cross. And that He would rise again from the dead would be the validation and the vindication that His death upon the cross was a sufficient sacrifice to take away the sin of all of those who would believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as our Lord begins this great commission... There is the prophecy of the Scripture. That is where He begins this final great commission. To underscore for them and for us that the message of the Gospel is rooted and grounded in Old Testament Scripture. The Gospel does not begin in the New Testament. The Gospel began to unfold at the dawn of human history. It was promised and proclaimed by the patriarchs. It was foretold of the prophets long ago. And if we are to be effective in fulfilling the Great Commission, there needs to be a, a breadth about our understanding of the entire storyline of the Bible, as well as the big picture of Christ in all of the parts of the Bible, to see Christ in the Law of Moses, to see Christ in the Prophets, to see Christ in the Psalms, that Christ is the hero of the Bible, that Christ is the central message of the Bible. Let me put it to you this way. Open the Bible anywhere and Christ comes stepping forward. He is to be at the very central point 
of our gospel witness. And so this is where Jesus begins his great commission by laying the firm foundation and underscoring the superstructure of the Old Testament revelation. The New Testament stands on the shoulders of the Old Testament, and it is necessary to understand the Old Testament in presenting the New Testament. It is not either or, it is both and. But the New Testament is the fulfillment of the promises and the prophecies of the Old Testament. So what we bring forth to the world is a message that is vast, it is rich, it is deep, it is intricate, it is full of prophecies and full of perfections, and many proofs contained therein regarding the authenticity of its message. It speaks, I think, to all of us before I move on by way of application. I believe that it is necessary for all of us here today to be very familiar with the Old Testament. We need to be careful that we are always reading out of the Old Testament, that we know the Old Testament. It is the very, the, the pillars that uphold our gospel witness as it is given fuller expression in the New Testament. But remove those pillars, and our New Testament witness suffers and becomes limited and becomes less effective. Now I want you to note second, not only the prophecies of the Scripture, but second, I want you to see the preaching of the gospel. Beginning in verse 47, at the heart of the Great Commission is the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I want you to know, this is the, the, the very heart of our message. This is the very infrastructure and the very internal reality of our message. And that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in His name. As we go forward to fulfill the Great Commission, the, the very cutting edge of our message, as we present the person and work of Christ, are these two key words, repentance and forgiveness. We are to be speaking to others of repentance and forgiveness. With repentance, we are to be calling people to repentance. We are to be urging them to repentance. It is repentance that is mingled with saving faith that makes faith true saving faith. There is a faith that does not save. It is all head knowledge. It is merely an, an intellectual academic acquisition of historical facts and theological truths about Jesus Christ. It is possible to know the cognitive truths of the Bible and not be saved. That is a faith that does not save. It is only in the head. But the faith that does save, the faith that is true saving faith, is a faith that has repentance. It is a faith that is saturated with this, virtue, this, this gift that God bestows, the gift of repentance. Let me say it one more time. True saving faith is always accompanied with repentance. So that begs the question, what is repentance? Repentance is a deep sorrow over sin. Based upon the realization that my transgressions have violated and offended the holiness of God. Repentance is a heart wound in which one comes under the deep conviction of his or her own sin, his or her own sin. Repentance involves a change of mind. In fact, that's literally what the word repentance means. It is a change of mind in which one sees now the sinfulness of sin as being loathsome and offensive to God and now to my own eyes. 
Repentance involves also a change of heart in which one becomes broken hearted over one's sin. The foundations of the heart are, are broken up and there is contrition over sin. And there is a mourning over sin. Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And then it, repentance involves a change of will in which one is so broken hearted and one is so repulsed by their own sin and the guilt of their own depravity, that they turn away from sin, and they turn to the Lord and to paths that honor Christ. Repentance is a change of mind, it is a change of heart, and it is a change of will that turns the entire person away from the world and away from the pursuit of sin and away from being the subject of the devil. And they turn to the living Christ. And then by faith they believe upon Christ. And they are truly saved. Thus repentance lowers one in deep humility before God, it confesses sin, it acknowledges sin, and it seeks the only remedy to be found in the person and work of Jesus Christ. As Jesus now commissions His disciples, it is, now, it is no easy believism and cheap grace that they are to proclaim. They are to call for the total surrender of the lives of those who will hear them. They are to call for the total supreme allegiance and loyalty to Jesus Christ of all who will hear them. They are to call for repentance, that those who are in need of the Savior would come under the deep awareness of their own sin and the deep conviction of their sin and call out to God with a, st with a sense of urgency and desperation, God be merciful to me, the sinner. This call for repentance is nothing new. Throughout the Old Testament, the prophets of old called for the repentance of apostate Israel as well as all of the nations to turn from their wicked ways and to turn to the living God Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be white as wool. And when John the Baptist came on the scene, he came preaching repentance, did he not? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And when Jesus Christ inaugurated His public ministry, the very first word to come out of His mouth was the word, Repent. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And it would be this message that would continue throughout the book of Acts as Peter would stand up on the day of Pentecost. And in Acts 2, verse 38, when they said, What must we do? Repent for the forgiveness of sin. As we share the gospel of Jesus Christ in divine appointments, in settings and situations that the Lord opens up for us, as we speak to our children, as we speak to our grandchildren, as we carry the message of Christ to those who are around us, we must speak of repentance. And without repentance, faith is a counterfeit faith. Without repentance, Faith is a non-saving faith. Without repentance, faith is only an intellectual assent to historical facts that are contained in the Bible. Faith becomes real. Saving faith when it is accompanied by repentance. As we share the gospel with others, we, we must be those who call for repentance. Now the second key word 
And this is under the second heading of the preaching of the gospel. The second key word is forgiveness. The result of repentance is always forgiveness. Without repentance, there is no forgiveness. No one will ever have their sins washed away, and they will never find the forgiveness of God apart from repentance. What is forgiveness? Forgiveness is the cancellation of a debt that has been incurred by one in which the debt is so great and the debt is so large that there is no way that the one who is now in debt can ever pay off the accumulated debt. And because of this debt, there is now slavery, and the one who is in debt, to whom it is owed, and because it cannot be paid, is sold into a slave market, and the one who is in debt is now enslaved and cannot free him or herself out of this slavery because they cannot pay off the debt that is owed. And this debt is continually compounding, is continually escalating, and with the, with the progression of time, the debt mounts larger and larger and larger. No amount of good works can ever remove this debt. No amount of religious good deeds can ever remove the escalating mountain of debt that is rising up that I have incurred by the breaking of the law of God. And the wages of sin is death. But the message of forgiveness is the message that God has canceled out our sins in the death of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that Jesus has taken our certificate of debt, Colossians 2, 14, and it has been nailed to the cross, and all of our sins have been nailed to that cross. And Jesus, in His death, and in the shedding of His blood, and in the giving of His life, He has paid off every single sin that you and I have ever committed against God and therefore has paid off the entirety of our sin debt which we have incurred against a holy God. One death, He has canceled out the transgressions and the debt of everyone who will believe upon Him. And this is the message that we take to the world that you no longer have to remain in slavery to sin. You no longer have to remain in debtor's prison. You no longer have to live under the tyranny of this debt that you can never pay off before God. That Christ, through His death, His sacrificial death upon the cross, He has removed our offenses and He has canceled out our debt by incurring it upon Himself. And God took our sins and transferred them to the Lord Jesus Christ. And Him who knew no sin, God made to be sin for us. And in becoming sin for us, He incurred all of our debt owed to God. And when He cried out, it is finished. That cry meant, Paid in full. There is nothing that you and I can do to add to it. There is no tip that we can add to what He has purchased and what He has done. There is no meager contribution that we can make. We cannot empty our shallow pockets and add to the infinite value of what He did upon Calvary's cross. In fact, if you and I try to add anything to what He has accomplished upon the cross, we may not have His free gift. 
The message that we bring to sinners is the most glorious message. It is the most wonderful message. We announce to the world that their sins may be forgiven. They may be set free from the debt of sin through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And would you please note what follows in verse 47? It is in His name. Do you see that in verse 47? Repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in His name. That is to say, all forgiveness is found in Jesus Christ alone. Apart from Christ, there is no forgiveness of sins. The only way forgiveness will be appropriated is in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The word name here refers to all that Jesus is. It refers to the person and work of Christ. It refers to His virgin birth his sinless life, his substitutionary death, his bodily resurrection, his present enthronement at the right hand of God the Father. It refers to the entirety of the message of Jesus Christ. That Jesus, the Son of God, came down from heaven on a saving mission to go to a cross, the cross, and to die in the place of His people and purchase forgiveness on their behalf, and it is the only way that our slate can be cleaned that we may have full acceptance with God in heaven. It is all in the name of Jesus Christ. Peter said there is salvation in no other name, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Everyone must come to the name of Jesus to be saved. If Buddha and Buddhists are to be saved, if Tiger Woods is to be saved, he must come and bow the knee to Jesus and confess his sin. Good Buddhists go to hell forever. Every Muslim, every cult member, every Mormon, every Jehovah's Witness, everyone on the planet, if they are to have forgiveness of their sins, must come to the Son of God, the Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ, and call upon His name for salvation. This is the preaching of the gospel. As we go into the world, we are not presenting a way to heaven. We are presenting the only way to heaven. This is the exclusivity of salvation in Christ alone. I want you to note, third, the parameters of the mission. Verse, at the end of verse 47, the parameters of the mission. Where should the Great Commission be carried out? How far must it be taken? What are the borders? What are the parameters? Notice what he says at the end of verse 47. To all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. In other words, start where you are and work out. Here is the global extent of the Great Commission. And this too underscores the exclusivity of salvation in Christ alone. This was not simply a way of salvation for those who were in Jerusalem, but there was another way for those in Egypt, or another way for those in Babylon, or perhaps those in the, in the Western Hemisphere, there would be another way of salvation for them. The mere fact that he says to go to all the nations, it is implicit. There is no other message of salvation, of reconciliation with a holy God in heaven. This one way of salvation must be taken to all of the nations because there is no other way for all of the nations to be saved except through Christ. 
And all of this was taught in the Old Testament as well. Now, the Old Testament is, is crystal clear on this. Isaiah 45, 22. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. Isaiah 49, verse 6. It is too small a thing. God speaking to the Messiah. It is too small a thing that you should be my servant and to raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the preserved ones of Israel. Let me stop right there. What God is saying to Jesus Christ in sending Him to this world to die for our sins, He is saying it is too small a thing that you would only save Israel. You're too great of a Savior. Your atonement is too perfect. Your sacrifice is too glorious. It's not simply for Israel. I will also make you, God says, a light to the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. And it is the duty of the people of God to take this message to the ends of the earth, for there is no other way of salvation. The Old Testament concludes with the book of Malachi in our arrangement. And God is speaking in Malachi 1, verse 11. From the rising of the sun to its setting, meaning all day, every day, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense is going to be offered in my name and a grain offering that is pure. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. When we come to the New Testament, it's the same. John 4, 42. This one is indeed the Savior of the world. Acts 1, 8. You shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth. Everyone whom we meet on planet Earth is someone who needs to hear about the Lord Jesus Christ. No matter where we are, no matter what we are doing, no matter who we come in contact, that person needs to hear about Jesus Christ because they have a common problem. It is a sin problem, and there is only one solution to that sin problem, and it is the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everyone is a candidate for the gospel of Christ, and we are to proclaim it freely to the world. I want you to note fourth in verse 48, the privilege of the disciples. Jesus says in verse 48, He speaks of this extraordinary privilege that was afforded to them to testify of this glorious message of the forgiveness of sins. He says, you are witnesses of these things. Please note, every disciple is a witness for Christ. The only question is, what kind of a witness? Are we faithful or are we unfaithful? Are we effective or are we ineffective? Are we those who lift up our voice or are we those who remain silent? But every disciple is a witness of one kind or another. Jesus pronounces them. You are witnesses of these things. Now, please note, he does not say you are spectators. You are not speculators. You are not philosophers. You are not moralists. You are not legislators. You are witnesses, and their business is to tell the truth of what they have seen and heard. They have been personal eyewitnesses of the earthly public ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. They had seen His sinless life. They had beheld His powerful miracles. They had witnessed His sovereign authority. They had heard His profound teaching. 
And there was a stewardship involved with this. They must now testify in the courts of the hearts of the people of the world with this witness of who Jesus is. This is what 1 John 1, 1 means. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life, and the, word, and the life was manifested, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you. That's what they did. They testified what they had seen and heard. At this time, there was no printing press, there was no television, there was no radio, there was no email, there was no web page, there was no technology of, of the modern world. The way that this message of forgiveness would be spread would be one by one by one, from mouth to mouth, life to life, person to person. They were to be witnesses in the marketplace, in the temple, at the city gate, on the road, wherever they were. And despite all of the modern technology that is now afforded to us, the most effective way for the message of forgiveness to go forth, it still remains one on one. Speaking to others about the Lord Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of sin, you are my witnesses. Also, please note, you are not my judges to sit in condemnation over a, over a sinful world. Neither does it say you are my prosecuting attorneys to indict and bring charges against uh, the world. You are my witnesses to bring the message of forgiveness. You are to testify. Now, we have not seen Christ with our visual eyes, and we have not heard Christ with our own ears. So how do we bear witness? Three ways. And for those of you in fellowship groups tonight, this is a great point for you to discuss tonight. Write this down. We are a witness for Christ. Number one, we give witness to others of the early witness of the apostles. We testify to what they bore witness to. We speak and say what they said and recorded in Scripture. We are to be like a cave. They have spoken into us, and there is to be the echo that comes out of us exactly what they said. This is how we bear witness for Christ. We repeat and we reiterate what the apostles saw and heard. We are not allowed to go beyond what the apostles have recorded. We are not allowed to add to nor subtract. We are to testify what is recorded in Scripture that they have written. Second, we are to give testimony to what Christ has done in our own lives. We're to be like the blind man in John chapter 9 who said, One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. He drove the religious leaders of Israel crazy. They became wacky after hearing him say that over and over and over. This one thing I do know, I once was blind, but now I see. Who is he? What are his credentials? I don't know. It's a strange thing that you don't know. But one thing I do know is once I was blind, but now I see. And to give a testimony of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done in your life, what your life was before you were saved, how you came to know Christ, and the transformation in your life since coming to Christ. If you're saved, you have a testimony. And tell others of what God has done in your life. And then there's a third testimony that we are to give, a third witness that we are to give, and it is the manner with which we live our lives. Now, this really becomes the, the, the validating witness for the first two witnesses. But there should be a, such a difference about our lives. There should be such an unexplainable quality about our lives that is like nothing of this world, that only God could make this kind of change in one's life. We are to witness in all three of these ways. 
The last thing that I want you to see in verse 49 is the power of the Spirit. How would this group of common, ordinary people hope to fulfill such a worldwide assignment? How could they possibly fulfill this task? There's only one answer. It is in the power of the Holy Spirit. So we read in verse 49, And behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you. But this promise is the promise of the gift of the Holy Spirit that would be given to all disciples by which He would supernaturally empower by His Spirit each of His disciples to fulfill their part in, in carrying out the Great Commission. They could not do this in their own ability, not in their own strength, not in their own ingenuity. They were totally insufficient for this task. But the Great Commission would be carried out in the power of the Holy Spirit, and they would come to realize the supernatural power of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost when they were in the upper room, and the Father and the Son would pour out the Spirit of God upon these disciples, and they suddenly would be, become like new men. And Peter, who previously was, was ashamed and, and afraid to even say to a little maiden girl that I am one of the followers of this Nazarene, now he is willing to stand up on the day of Pentecost and say, You men of Israel, listen unto me. This is that that was spoken of the prophet Joel. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Peter was a totally changed and transformed man. How can you explain it? Peter, who was always putting his foot in his mouth. Peter, who was always uh, in reverse. Peter, who was always crumbling at the wrong time. Now he steps into this moment. He is bold as a lion. He roars this witness. The only explanation is twofold. One, he had seen the risen Christ, and two, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was ready now to turn the world upside down. And he says to us in Second Peter 1 that it is a far better witness than even seeing or hearing Christ to have the more sure word of the prophetic Scripture. Because I know some of us are thinking, well, if I could have seen Jesus raised from the dead, or if I could have listened to His messages and beheld His miracles, or heard the voice of the man of transfiguration, yeah, then I would really be ready to turn the world upside down. But I'm at a disadvantage, and that's exactly where you're wrong. Because Peter himself says in his second epistle that we have a more sure witness than if we heard the audible voice of God on the Mount of Transfiguration and beheld the glory of Christ when we have the written, objective, canonical Scripture, it is more certain and more sure than even what your eyes would see or your ears would hear. Because it is, it is objective, it is written, it is, it is permanent, it is eternal. This is the great commission that our Lord gave to His disciples. And it has come down through the centuries, and this is our hour in history. This is our watch. This is our generation. This is our time to be alive. This is our opportunity to serve God. And it is this great commission that is the big picture for every one of our lives. And the small details of our lives, where I'm supposed to eat lunch on Tuesday and what I'm supposed to do here on Wednesday, these are very subordinate and they are very peripheral. And what is central and what is primary is that I be connected to this great commission and that I be used by God for the proclamation of the message of repentance and the person and work of Christ and the offer of forgiveness of sins 
to a lost and dying world. Parents, raise your children to send them out to testify to this truth. Men, as you go to work, testify of this truth. Ladies, as you are go to work or as you're in the neighborhood, speak of Christ. Young people, when you go to college, when you go to high school, when you go to junior high school, you are there as the witness of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are there to testify on His behalf, to tell people of the person and work of Christ. And sometimes it's those of you, even in a Christian high school, that needs to do the greatest work of evangelism, to speak of the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us step into the fulfillment of these words, and may the Lord's blessing be upon us. May the power of the Holy Spirit clothe us with power from on high. If you're here today and you've never believed upon Christ, I think it should be very apparent to you today what the Lord requires of you, that you must repent of your sin. This is not an intellectual head game with you and God. You'll never win that. This must go far beyond just the acquisition of, of facts about religion or about Christ. You must come to the point where you see that you have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And if you do not see that, there is no hope for you. You are, you are blind as blind can be if you cannot see that you have sinned and you need to have your sins forgiven. You cannot step into eternity and be received by a holy God if there is even one half of one sin that is still contaminating your soul. There must be the total forgiveness of all of your sins. And there is only one Savior. There is only one way to have that sin forgiven. And it is to, to repent and to believe upon Christ. And to commit your life to Him. To surrender your life to Him. To give your life to Christ. To surrender to His Lordship. To say, Lord, be merciful to me, the sinner. And Christ will forgive you. He will cleanse you. He will pardon you. He will cancel out this Mount Everest of debt that you have, in, that you have acquired. And all of your sins will be removed. This is the greatest offer that has ever been offered to you. Most of you here today have received it. But there undoubtedly are those who have not yet come to receive this forgiveness from God. It is all in the name of Christ. Believe upon Him and you will be forgiven forever. Let us pray. Father, have mercy upon those who are in need of mercy here today. Show grace to those who are in need of grace here today. Bring conviction of sin. Bring brokenness over sin. Break up the foundations of crusty, hard hearts that there might be the sweetness of saving grace applied by faith to hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.